it falls on the father, but there's something magical in it, and if, and if you can kind of analyze what it is, it's, 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 it's worth doing, and I think Gopnik attempted that. But, uh, well, what is it about the, the Gopnik article that intrigued you about the style that you were talking about? Uh, Adam Gopnik's recent uh, homage, I guess you'd have to call it, to Thurber, uh, goes on quite a lot about uh, Thurber's style and how it differed from the style of earlier humorists, how it di differed even from uh, from Mencken's style or uh, Alexander Wolcott's style, and uh, I guess it's all uh, true. It was a very considered style since Thurber did not win through to immediate publication. He really had to wait in the ante room of the unpublished for longer than most writers of his stature. I think you could say he was past th 35, more or less, wasn't he, before he really began to make an impression and get into print. So he was a man who worked at his style, had to, I think, uh, locate the idiomatic tone uh, which makes us laugh because Thurber was able to write those sentences that actually spring a laugh out of a sitting person, a person sitting alone in a room, and that's quite a stylistic feat, isn't it, to write something truly funny. And in my life in hard times, you kind of keep laughing. I mean, it begins to roll and develop. And I don't know exactly how he does it, except uh, uh, as with many humorists, there's this air of be befuddlement that's allowed to creep in. I mean, you feel the author's confusion. You feel uh, he doesn't quite know where the sentence is going to go, just as he didn't know quite where the moment went that he's describing. So there's a funny way in which you get with him in the very act of framing the words. I don't know. I'm not describing this no, very I well. But right. I mean, there was a line in one story that ends... Um, uh, I don't know. I don't think about it much anymore. And that's how the, 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 the whole thing ends. And uh, I don't think Benchley would have written that at the end of a, a thing or, or anybody right. else. I think it's a 20th century kind of uh, a modern yeah. writer to do that. Just kind of <laughs> throw your hands up. And I think Gopnik's idea that Thibber was modern in a way that Benchley and Wolcott and even authors almost of his same age were not is kind of good. Uh, uh, in some way, uh, Thurber was metaphysical enough to feel existential angst. I mean, he felt the death of God or the absence of God. He felt the aimlessness of existence and the pettiness of it. And to write about in consequence in a way that you can actually sell the product and market it and entertain people is no small feat. And I think in some of the more serious stories, as well as the lighter things, the, the, the basic inconsequence of, of, of our lives is, is caught and made to seem in some way ludicrous and funny and gentle and abusing, and that the style, in its willingness to sort of end on a flat note, say, or to end on a vague note, uh, uh, answers to this sense of the, the human experience which he which he had. Yeah, it's interesting because certain writers, I guess like Wolcott and others, they're still they're kind of just picking up out of the nineteenth century. I think of William Dean Howells, you kind of always associate with the latter half of the nineteenth century, perhaps not the the twentieth century. And I think there's there's always a few writers that, that bridge that and Maybe Thurber. What Thurber and White did bring to the uh, New Yorker was a sense of nervousness. I think they were both truly nervous men, nervous in different ways, but you get a lot of that feeling in, in their pieces, don't you, of a nervous man walking warily down the street. What's going to happen next? Will a cup of milk spill on me? Will a rock fall out of the sky? And they both uh, brought into the fold of humorous... Uh, vocabulary, this this real sense of dread, a, a, a sense of dread that, that isn't so funny in other writers. Kafka, of course, is the master of dread, and Kafka is, again, a very humorous writer, although it's a, presented in a d different way. But there is something Kafka-esque about the world of Thurber's Columbus, isn't there? Uh, and even the way that people loom, as they loom in Kafka, the way the father, the grandfather, all these people with their little manias of living in these enclosed worlds of fear that the dam's going to break or that electricity's going to leak out of the light bulb, they do loom in the, in the way Ka Kafka's uh, people do. Uh, they, they become spiritual presences, and you see them almost as a child sees them. 
as big, mysterious people talking nonsense, and these are adults. You know, this is the what we're going to grow into. <laughs> the Bimba would have loved to, to be, you know, discussed in terms of, of great writers because I know that was a, a thing for him. He always felt he wasn't taken seriously as a writer, and uh, they all thought he was just a big clown. You know. Um, but that meant so much to me. Has it surprised you that he was obsessed with Henry James, for instance, that that was a model for, um, not, not directly, but there was a... No. Weber had a very refined uh, mind, after all. He was uh, no dope, as we say, and Henry James, again, was one of those nervous moderns, wasn't he? I mean, really, the first great American modern was Henry James, the first man to try to capture the peculiar, a peculiar nothingness. Uh, at the center of so much human activity. Uh, uh, T.S. Eliot had some nice words to say about Thurber, and so did Auden. He actually did receive uh, some kudos from fairly high, high places in his, in his lifetime. But uh, I think it just whetted his appetite for more, in a way, didn't it? He became almost insatiable in terms of praise. Uh, there was a story told around the New Yorker when I was there, probably apocryphal, that he was dining with Maeve Brennan and her husband, St. Clair McElway, and announced, I don't know after how many martinis, but he announced that he was the greatest humorist since Rabelais. Maeve Brennan, who was a spicy little Irish woman, said, no, you're not, you're just a conceited old blind man. And Thurber deftly reached down, grabbed the rung of her chair, and pulled the chair out from under her. So she went bump on the Al Algonquin floor, leaving her husband, St. Clair McElway, with the predicament of whether or not you should hit a blind man. And I think he decided not to in the end, but it shows uh, how proud and nervously proud and kind of irrational, uh, irrationally irascible Thurber had become in his, in his twilight years. Actually, speaking of women, uh, the whole stereotype that uh, is often associated with is of a, a very aggressive, domineering woman character versus the kind of befuddled uh, dreamer, the Walter Mitty type. I mean, uh, is that something that uh, appealed to you or that you felt you understood or do you felt it or feel that it's just a stereotype that was uh, overused? Uh, the Thurber women, those women in their sort of buttonless uh, dresses, <laughs> are in an odd way potent. Uh, I mean, they're sexy even. Uh, somebody complained to Dorothy Parker, I think it was, that Thurber's women weren't sexy, and she said they, that they are to Thurber's men. Uh, and you can feel a kind of action going on in there. Uh, Thurber is probably very typically American in that he sees himself surrounded by do domineering women who want too much and so on, but that is, after all, the way Huck Finn felt, it's the way Ishmael felt, it's the way American men seem to frame their condition in terms of the women. There's one of those drawings in which the woman is the house and reaching out. I mean, the woman is the house, the woman is the establishment, the woman is the rules. And the man is sort of tiptoeing around, trying to evade the, evade the rules. I don't know what his real relations with, with women were uh, like, um, but he seems to have taken a healthy interest in them. Uh, and uh, although in the end, you, your image of Febre is not of a Romeo uh, somehow, but is of one of those bachelor drinkers that the 20s were so productive of kind of no man whose notion of a really good time is to go to Toots Shores or wherever and, and get a load on and talk all night. Uh, so that, that, I hope that, I don't think that kind of man exists in numbers anymore, but certainly there were a lot of them in Thurber's day. Yes. Uh, like that? Maybe we can talk about, uh, that's been one um, criticism of Thurber that, that it might, in fact, date him because of his uh, um, kind of uh, his, his attitude towards women, uh, and whether and maybe we could also talk about the whole issue of humor and, and how a writer deals with uh, a humorist deals with, with the passage of time and so forth. Are we being taped? Uh -huh. Really, it's all happened. God, you guys are quick. Uh, all writing dates. Uh, 
And it's the first 20 years, I guess, that go by after the author's dead that tells the tale. Most writing totally fades, like, say, the writing of Lewis Bromfield or Edna, Edna Ferber has faded, and now is read only by American lit specialists. And if you survive that 20 years or 30 years, uh, I guess you've gone into a post-dating uh, phase. And I would like to think that Ferber is there, the fact that you, the show is being done and... Uh, all that, you see the books for sale, indicates to me that he has, uh, at least in his best books, uh, survived. The kind of attitudes expressed in the cartoons um, are quite 30s and 40s specific, perhaps. And it would be not correct now, maybe, to write about the war between men and women uh, or say that's the first Mrs. So-and-so up there to a mounted woman, but uh, it doesn't seem to me that the basic biology and sociology of uh, the gender situation in this country has changed so much that you can't recognize humorist, but the very uh, space in magazines that Ferber uh, eventually filled is gone. That space isn't really there. Eventually, you feel was very much a natural who wrote quite quickly. Uh, part of the charm of those pieces is their lightness and their carelessness, in a way. They're, they're tossed off feeling, uh, and who wasn't angling for literary immortality because as soon as a better deal came along in the form of the movies, he took it. He stopped writing. Eventually, just said not and went, and went to the movies and drank himself to an early, early grave. Uh, oddly enough, I find Benchley reread often quite funny still. There is a kind of magic there, whatever it's a rhythm or this persona of the confused innocent, whatever it is, Benchley still reads to me. Uh, Thurber, a more literary artist, uh, probably will survive best in the early pieces. The, I think he wrote before 1950 or maybe 1945 uh, even. Uh, since he didn't really generate the kind of mass that uh, his uh, his idol Henry James did. It's not a, merely a matter of bulk. It's a question of how... Something about moral imagination, I don't know. Uh, Henry James had enough of it to really conceive people in the round, whereas Thurber's characters are, by and large, as seen by Thurber. They are figments on a kind of screen which is Thurber's mind, and so they don't acquire the three-dimensionality of the great fiction. But he, you know, great, who's great? Uh, Thurber certainly made a lot of people, including me, very happy through his writing. And uh, I think now, uh, among American humorists, he does leap to mind bracketed with Twain. Twain, who in addition to his other talents, uh, could create fictional characters, at least in one novel he did, and create, uh, had an epic touch. Uh, I'm not sure Thurber ever quite had the epic touch that Twain had, but he had a lot of the same thing. You feel you're in touch with um, real America, whether the Midwest is realer than the East, I don't know, but in some way it seems to seems to be, and uh, you feel that the sensibility being expressed there, the kind of surprise, and even the undercurrent of indignation that is very strong in Twain is also felt in Thurber. Um, in the end, it's verbal magic, isn't it? It's just a way of putting a couple dozen words in a sentence that, that really twists reality in a way that makes us laugh in recognition. Laughter is recognition. It is, it's a kind of a salute, isn't it, to the surprising truth of something, and I would say Thurber's best often did present that kind of truth. Yeah, I was thinking of the nights in bed. Uh, I think it was just the opening sentence, like something like, "I think the high water mark of my years in Columbus <laughs> was the night that they found Father." <laughs> I think all you have to do is read that, and it, and it, it grabs you right there. And uh, maybe it's just the deadpan. Maybe that was uh, unusual for a humorist at that time, or something. But uh, I think he once distinguished that the English try to make the commonplace dramatic. And the American humor tried to make a dramatic commonplace. What what um, makes you makes my life in hard times 
especially precious, maybe, is that it does come out of the Columbus thing, the kind of pre-sophisticate, pre-France, uh, the pre-grown-up Thurber. So uh, it was, he makes it into a very peculiar place, doesn't he? Full of a kind of sense of anticlimax and Civil War monuments and uh, panics in the night and uh, whole families of eccentrics. It's very hard to think of Columbus or even to go there without imagining Thurber's world. I mean, you expect to f have funny things happen to you in Columbus. I was once invited to spend the night in the Thurber house uh, as a treat for me as an old, as an announced Thurberite. And uh, I didn't know I was going to be alone in the, in the house, though. And so when they all left, then I was there uh, in this uh, very average house, but full of Thurber's ghosts, full of Thurber's stories, listening to creaks. It was a very hard night to fall asleep, and I woke up quite early, very glad to see the daylight. So at any rate, Thurber, that particular world, the Columbus of Thurber's imagination, uh, is, I think, one of his most potent images, most potent con contributions to the American store of imagery. He made the Midwest in itself seem somewhat droll, something that Garrison Keillor, say, has, has furthered. Uh, I wonder if Keillor could exist quite the way he does without Thurber's example. And also, I think he differs a little from Keillor because of the um, inherent savagery in some of Thurber that, that maybe doesn't come across as much in Keillor, although they, uh, they all have a lot of similarities. It's yeah. different. Keillor, Keillor uh, you're very much aware of him uh, speaking to a Midwestern audience, whereas Thurber's audience was distinctly sophisticated and transatlantic and New York. Thurber became a New York wit. But like many a New York bit, he came out of the sticks, so to speak. I wonder how many of the New York bits really came out of New York. I guess Parker did. Uh, but yeah, by and large, you came to New York uh, with your little bundle of Americanism and, uh, and then began to strum on it. Yeah, he actually, I remember reading about the Algonquin Round Table that I grew up thinking he was associated with. And he was in part. He knew some of the members. They never actually attended the lunches. Uh, I remember reading E.B. White, and he once went to one of the lunches, and they left after that lunch, and they never went back, saying they're a bunch of old farts, you know, we're retelling the old stories over and over. Um, uh, so uh, that surprised me, but uh, knowing a little bit more about him, I realized that he, maybe that was more of a urbane kind of existence that he didn't want to. The Algonquin Round Table, you feel, was kind of theatrical at base. A lot of the members had some theater experience uh, uh, and uh, was kind of a, a skit, wasn't it, that they were putting on for this audience of, uh, of rubes uh, who were soaking it up. And uh, Thurber and White were much into the printed word, I think, and uh, Ross's own particular rigor and clarity and narrowness of thinking restricted them all uh, to think in terms of what you could deliver on a printed page. And the, that Thurber became, toward the end of his life, a kind of thespian, a kind of a actor, endless interviews, appeared in his own stage play. All that, uh, in a way, abandoned the spirit of the, the very chaste spirit of the, 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 the New Yorker of the 30s and 40s. And he also, he left New York, uh, finally, or, or he never really lived there very much. He had this place at the Algonquin, uh, kind of this heritage, but he, he removed himself from that whole world and lived in various places in Connecticut, um, finally settling, I guess, in Cornwall for more of the time. But uh, you yourself left uh, New York, too, uh, I guess, finding that it would be better to work outside of that. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your experience and, and how you might imagine Thurber too uh, felt about leaving the scene of all this activity and, and what that's about for a writer? Yeah. Thurber uh, didn't spend an awful lot of time in, in New York, uh, actually. He rather quickly resorted to various Connecticut suburbs. I think even if you're not blind, uh, New York is a tough place to <laughs> live in. It takes a lot of energy just to do the daily things, and also there's a kind of competitive energy. Uh, from my own experience, I'd always wanted to live in New York. That was my idea of heaven, and I was able to get there with a nice job at the New Yorker, the very place I wanted to be. 
And yet after not too many years, uh, I felt I'd do better myself. I'd breathe better, I'd be a better writer, I'd even make a, a better New Yorker contributor if I, if I left the physical city. And I didn't want to go to Connecticut at that point because Connecticut um, wasn't really the country. It was a kind of New York with the same high cost of living and the same uh, sophisticated awareness. I wanted to go further yet, so my Connecticut was Massachusetts. Uh, but I can certainly understand why Thurber, especially with his visual problems, felt safer away from the big city. And yet he did keep coming back, didn't he? And in some way, his audience always seems to have been those people around the New Yorker. I mean, even toward the end when he was quite a sick man, he kept returning to the Algonquin and speaking to whoever would listen, and the audiences maybe were getting smaller by that point, and the old friends were dying off, too. Uh, there is a sadness to Thurber's last years, which doesn't attach to every writer's last years, but in some funny way he seemed to want more than he was getting, even though he had been highly honored and really pretty well paid for his life's work. It really was a swan song, the, uh, the Thurber concert. Yeah, really, and I've had, you know, fans have gone there and they're very disappointed in the town, and it's just the, the very spaces of the way the houses sit, you know, all that is, it wells up in me, this sense of being a child and alive, somehow amazing, everything is kind of amazing and very present, very mysterious and yet there. Yeah, it's hard to, to um, American writing in general suffers from the loss of innocence. Uh, Hemingway, a classic example of a man who could write very well about, about his initial impressions including the war, because he was only a teenager, really, but who, uh, in a sense, as uh, his input facility totally shut down after about 25, and uh, it's hard to stay open uh, after 25 in an odd way. We ask of writing a kind of uh, innocence. I suppose it's the Puritan heritage translated into literary terms, but we want a kind of freshness, a kind of Garden of Eden feeling <laughs> uh, that uh, you do get when you write about your boyhood. Thurber's Columbus had for him, clearly, that great sense about the clocks of Columbus uh, strike often in my dreams, uh, that notion that you, that you are who you, you are where you come from, really. If you were... Uh, yeah, I have to wait a moment uh, um, to reload. Uh, so we had a short we'll roll. Just one question. Yeah. The following is Wild Sound from Sound Rule Number Three. Uh, or say that's the first Mrs. So and So up there to a mounted woman, but uh, it doesn't seem to me that the basic biology and sociology of uh, the gender situation in this country has changed so much that you can't recognize that there is, yes, there is a war. There is a war, and it's still going on, and Thurber's drawings still seem, to me at least, very funny and undated uh, on it. Uh, being dated is not something really any writer, humorous or not, can worry too much about. You're trying to make a living in the now. You're trying to speak to a certain audience uh, now. And uh, what posterity makes of it, you just have to have the faith that there's enough real stuff heartfelt and well-crafted stuff that it might last. And uh, Thurber, more than most humorists, more, much more than Benchley, say, I think thought of himself as a literary figure, as a literary performer. He wanted to last. He wanted to join the greats, of whom Henry James was his idea of a real great, yes? Uh, so Fitzgerald, really, I didn't know who he... I didn't know if he... Uh, but that's any more, I suppose. The closest things are columnists like Buchwald and uh, Russell Baker, uh, who uh, uh, tw three times a week try to write something humorous. But the very uh, space in magazines that Thurber uh, eventually filled is gone. That space isn't really there. But eventually, 